Thank you very much, Stephen, and a stimulating um, talk as always. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into uh, the panel now, uh, the, our first panel of, of, of this afternoon. What we want to do is to make sure that this has loads of space for uh, you to um, contribute uh, and um, be part of the discussion. So um, <clears throat> rather than uh, each panelist doing a presentation, we've just asked people to, uh, to do a quick introduction uh, uh, of, of themselves, and we'll all be sat up there in the front in a moment. But first, um, we're going to um, invite Jerry to uh, just give a quick introduction to herself, and there's a short film that Jerry would like to, to show to just give some background on the work. And then after that, I'll invite everybody up to the table. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jerry Turvey. Um, I'm a choreographer and dance artist, um, and I'm a passionate believer in the body and the connection of body to mind. Um, and a couple of years ago, I worked with an organization in Huddersfield that's an arts and, health, arts and mental health organization. And we created a piece uh, with a small group of um, adults uh, that we toured to different places, and it's called The Space Between. And this film that we're about to show is not the actual piece, but the making of the piece and the participants talking about their experience and how they felt. So um, anyway, so that's all it is. It's four minutes long, so in case you fall asleep. there might be a bit of a hiatus so I can do my spiel now um, so uh, this uh, this session really is about um, looking at the um, research um, practice methodologies for arts and health and it's very very interesting to me how method has been a, a key focus of all of the conversations that we've had so far uh, today and, um, and I've just been noting down um, the number of different methodologies that have been outlined. So we've caught, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, Circum circumambulatory knowledge, ethnography, practice-led practice, anthropology, narrative inquiry, co-design, and most recently, mutual innovation. Interesting uh, concept. So there are lots of different methods that are being used and applied. Um, it would be interesting to hear from the panel the methods that, and approaches that they, they're using and the ways uh, in which they're making decisions about why they're, make, they're using those particular methods and what the advantages and, and disadvantages of those methods are. And then I'd like to open it up to the audience and um, I'd really like to hear if, if there are particular approaches that you're taking or if there are other uh, the questions that you'd like to ask of the, of the room or of, uh, of our panel members as well. Um, how are we doing? Still working on it. Okay. <clears throat> Can I maybe then ask um, Hannah and Laura to uh, come and, and introduce themselves? Laura has really kindly stepped in for Sarah Astle. Sarah, unfortunately, has, her child is, is not well, um, so has had to go and, and pick her child up. So um, to just Laura asked me to let you know that. So it's, this is a bit on the hoof for, for Laura and Hannah. Um, you might as well stay there and Hi everyone. So we're dance people and you're very static. So let's just start with a little stretch. Put your arms up. Come on, wake yourselves up. We've had lunch and we're tired. Have a little shake. Turn to the person next to you whilst you're shaking. Oh, sorry. I'll shake. Sorry. I'll shake. Excellent, good. Just oh, good. Excellent. You a bit more awake? Good. So this session is very very much about a conversation not about us presenting but i'll quickly tell you who i am just so it makes a bit more sense so my name's hannah i am the programs director at yorkshire dance i trained as a dancer and i'm a moving being so this has been very hard for me today because i'm sat still um so yorkshire dance has been supporting the development of dance since 1981 so we've got 36 years of experience of developing dance projects across the whole of yorkshire and we're also a kind of sector development um agency in Yorkshire, so supporting dance across the region. 
Um, we know that participating in dance is awesome. It has great benefits for people um, emotionally, socially, physically. I could go on. Um, we know this anecdotally, and we're very good at producing lovely case studies and things that talk about our participants. Um, but what we need is greater partnerships, such as the partnership with the Cultural Institute and the University of Leeds, to help us be more robust in how we evidence our programmes. Um, to do that, there's some very practical reasons. It gives us um, a stronger argument to tell our story, which helps us get money, uh, which we need, because otherwise we can't continue doing the work we do. So that's a, one very key thing. It also helps our participants understand a bit more about what's going on for them. And actually, there's a lot of positive benefits we've seen from um, uh, sharing the research with the participants who have been part of the research to help them know more about what's happening for them. Um, so a couple of examples of our, re our past research, we did a programme called Dancing into the Third Age, which explored the barriers uh, and enablers to participating in contemporary dance for older adults. Um, Dancing in Time, which Laura can talk more about because she was the researcher on that programme, exploring the health and well-being benefits of dance for older adults. And then the Yorkshire Dance Youth Programme, which you heard Dr. Louise Astell talk about this morning, which was an ethnograph ethnographic um, piece of research um, that took place uh, as a longitudinal study. So our current research, we've just managed to raise a whole chunky bit of money from Sport England to do a programme called Dance On, uh, which um, will basically take the Dancing in Time model and expand it across the whole of Yorkshire, or in three, three areas, sorry, Doncaster, Bradford and Leeds. Um, and that's looking at whether a community dance program reduces um, physical inactivity and improves the mental and physical well-being of socio-economically disadvantaged community-dwelling older women. Catchy. <laughs> Catchy. Um, and then the other program that we're just launching now is another three-year program. It's called Immature Company, which if you say it really quickly, sounds like Immature Company, which is why I like it. Uh, and that's looking at the impact of touch on people living with dementia in residential care homes. So, um, and we're using dementia care mapping as our main research tool, which I can talk more about if you're interested. And that's me. Thank you. So, hi everyone, um, I'm Laura, so I'm a lecturer in Sport and Exercise Sciences, but I was a research assistant on the Dancing in Time project, and now I am a postdoc researcher on the Sport England grant that Hannah briefly mentioned. So I'm going to quickly talk to you um, about Dancing in Time. So there's actually a nice booklet for you that came in your pack this morning, so that outlines the study um, in detail. But it was actually an intervention um, across Leeds, so three sites, and we were looking at the effects of contemporary dance on the risk of falling in older adults. So to do that, we used a mixed method approach, so some quantitative in the form of questionnaires um, and some qualitative. Initially, the research was designed uh, via focus groups, so I'll just plug a thank you to the Cultural Institute for funding that part of the project. So the questionnaires we used looked at balance and mobility. So that was actually done using a motor task. So that's the time it takes the older adults to stand up, walk three meters, turn back round and sit down. And that correlates with their risk of falling. So the longer the time it takes, the more at risk they are. Questionnaires were based around the fear of falling, uh, their mood. Uh, and we also looked at physical activity levels um, against their sedentary behavior. After the intervention, we also did some focus groups where we gained opinions uh, from the older adults about how they felt the dance had affected them, both physically and psychologically. And we also looked at the facilitators and the barriers to them partaking in the dance programme. So due to the success of that, uh, Leeds Public Health then funded another three sites to engage within the Dancing in Time programme, and that's just finished recently. Uh, and also this led to the larger grant from Sport England to widen the provision for dance um, across Yorkshire, so Leeds, Bradford uh, and Doncaster. So that's all kicking off at the moment. Uh, so we've had some co-design elements in that which has then led to the full award of the programme. And again, we're going to be looking at using both quantitative and qualitative measures for that study. So I'm going to leave it there because I feel like you can ask me questions uh, in the discussion. Okay.
I'm Jerry Turvey. I'm the choreographer and artistic director of Locomotion Dance Company. Since September 2013, we've been working on a piece called The Space Between. We finished it in April 2014. In The Space Between, we played with the idea of the physical space in our own bodies and the physical space between each other, as well as the idea that in different times of our lives, there is a space between reality and ourselves. We drew on the dancers' own experiences of their mental health to create the choreography. So for me, the, the, the process has been really interesting because I had no idea what it was for dance. I didn't know how long it would take or anything. Our first performance was really close to the beginning of the year. So it seemed like for the first few weeks we rammed loads of stuff in a very short period of time and that was really interesting because I didn't I could I couldn't even have possibly imagined that we could have got an entire dance piece in the first few weeks like when Jerry told me the first performance is in a few weeks I was like oh, how is that even possible that is not going to happen but it did and it was amazing and then and then the next thing that went through my mind was now we've got loads of time until our next performance. So if, if we can do all that in such a short period of time, what is it that we're going to be able, you know, how far can we take this? How, how much can we stretch this? And it's been, it's been really great seeing that whole process. Well, there's been all these amazing moments in, we've done sometimes we've done workshops and sometimes we've done like technique classes. So you learn something new about what you can do or what somebody else can do, and you you might be bending to the floor to do you know to get into into the day, and you'll see somebody doing something absolutely amazing over at the other side of the room. Wow, I wish I could do that. <laughs> so then you try and do that maybe. Like I, I think everybody liked. Bunty solo, and we were all a little bit envious and wanted to do Bunty solo. <laughs> when I actually got my solo together, I kind of like felt that my confidence grew a little bit more because you know everybody kind of like liked a little solo piece. A lot of the time, my mind really didn't come into it. I just kind of like moved and. Those were my best parts when I just didn't think about it, I just moved. Listen to like everybody else and listen to myself, you know, like my mind and body and just focused. The dance group, you know, everybody in the dance group, they've all formed good dancing relationships and we're all kind of like closer together for it. It, it wasn't the most difficult piece, but it's been the longest piece, like, what we've worked on. And, um, but I've enjoyed this piece the most, because it, uh, I know it'll be the most memorable piece. I think we all knew that we, that we had something special. You know, you know that the audience is sizzling and watching it. It's been a kind of emotional journey of on the first few weeks I was coming in here and I was really scared for the first 10 minutes and then it, it makes you relaxed and and that that has like a longer cycle whereby you know the first session you're more scared and then as you get into the sessions and as the year goes by the, there's this like greater cycle of relaxing and, and feeling more comfortable with yourself and your body and stuff and so that's been awesome as well. It's given me um, something to really focus on. I felt, you know, you know, really structured, you know, like within the group, along with everything else. It's really kept me together and kept me going, you know, kept my mental health stable, my physical well-being. It's, you know, done, done me the world of good.
Hello everybody, uh, my name is Anna Bunny and I'm the Engagement Manager at Manchester Museum but also a board member of the Happy Museum Project. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to talk about museums or talk about research there. Um, health and wellbeing work is very well embedded in the museum sector across the country and there's an organisation called Culture and Health and Wellbeing uh, which is an alliance of lots of different museums uh, that are all involved in health and wellbeing. Uh, we're a university museum in Manchester, um, and this is actually our inflatable museum that's in the cathedral, because we like to go out a lot. Um, we do a number of health and wellbeing projects, including where partnership is really key, working with autistic families, um, training health professionals, culture shots, so we have a good relationship with the local NHS trust, and uh, there's in fact a singing event with our partner organisation, the Whitworth, this Sunday. Um, I've just mentioned a couple of projects, um, if, oh, if I need help, if I, I've got the, oh, there we are. So this is Inspiring Futures, Wellbeing, uh, Volunteering for Wellbeing. It's a partnership project that we've worked with 10 organisations across Greater Manchester, and it's sort of targeted to encourage um, people at a, a, a danger of isolation. And uh, the reason I've done this because it's quite a big project funded by HLF so we've used a, um, a social return of investment model to uh, investigate. We're also involved in Not Grim So, Not So, let me get it right, Not So Grim Up North which is a research project uh, led by the University College uh, in partnership with Tyne and Weir Museums and Archives and Manchester Museum and the Whitworth Art Gallery and that's a much more in-depth project um, over three years using quantitative and qualitative methods to investigate um, by participating in museum programmes impacts on health and well-being. But I'm also here to talk about the Happy Museum. So the Happy Museum is a project that looks at how the museum sector can respond to the challenge of creating a more sustainable future. And it supports and provokes museum practice that places well-being within an environmental and future-facing frame, rethinking the role museums can play in creating more resilient people, places and planet. So what this is, it's actually, um, it came out of a lot of thinking and noting that when people participate in museum programmes, actually happiness or well-being or sustainability are outcomes. And it was inspired by sort of new economic thinking, especially things like the five ways of well-being, but also we mentioned the happiness index earlier on, lots of thinking like that. So there was a provocation, a paper put forward in 2012 that came with a number of sort of principles. And these principles above have been uh, the basis of investigating different ways that museums can create health and well-being and sustainability programmes. So, for example, there were 22 museums all across um, England and Wales and Scotland that did creative uh, projects looking at different ways of health and well-being in museums. So, for example, the Beanie in Canterbury did this fantastic programme called the Apocryphy, where people, visitors to the museum and local school children, um, created prescriptions based on the museum's collections that you could then hand to other people. Uh, Manchester Museum, we were one of the initial uh, of those 22 museums and we've been working on child-led play because child-led play is uh, well known for very, very importance for children's well-being. Um, there's a whole group of us now across the Happy Museum group that are looking at different ways of playful prompts can create, um, create well-being. One of the uh, methodologies that we use when we're testing out the principles is a story of change, so a logic model. So really emphasising on visioning a positive future and looking at the assets, uh, both internal and internal, that create, um, that create that story of change. It's very much all action research led as well. And one of the principles I put up before was about measure what matters. Um, where there's lots of toolkits and lots of different ways that the sector is trying out um, to help sort of evidence the benefit of the work. But measure what matters is important in that, and the fact that it's actually measuring what can then be helpful for us as practitioners, 
for the people that come to the museums, but also to evidence impact. So as part of the project, we've worked with uh, an econ economist called du Daniel Fujiwara from LSE, who's produced a figure of um, looking, reanalyzing re the taking part survey from our Office of National Statistics, that actually gives a financial benefit of, by participating in museums, is worth three, £3,200, but it's not about the monetary value, it's more about showing the impact of other people to stakeholders about the benefit of participating in museums. Another project that the museum has been doing that links with the Happy Museum is looking at um, sort of almost the opposite of that having a monetary basis to prove our, well, our well-being or sustainability, and this is working on people's values. Um, there's an organisation called Common Cause that has done work looking at um, what people value and basically the, the thing is is that most people think, most people themselves have very uh, beneficial values, so they love nature, they love the helping people, but unfortunately they think other people have more power greedy or the negative values. So we've been doing a work on in the museum looking at how we can um, bring everyone's values to light. Um, so for example, we've got a poster up here looking at the value of why people volunteer, and it's actually for, for good reasons, and we've been trialling our donation boxes. So rather than actually saying, if you give five pounds, this will help X number of people, but really more looking at saying, we do this because we want, ev we want everybody and the most people to participate. So that's me. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Jalland. I'm Artistic Director of Hoodwink. I'm a theatre maker, a practitioner. What I would really like to have done this afternoon is actually perform for you a short performance that we've had commissioned for hospitals. But instead of that, I will try to talk about it. During the course of today, I, I've learned my methodology, I think, which is therapeutic implotment, which is very interesting to find out, and mutual innovation, I've just also discovered, which is also very nice to go away and think about. Um, for the past five years, I've been working as an artist for Elevate, which is an arts, a team of arts activity taking place at Salisbury District Hospital. And Salisbury District Hospital's um, artistic programme is now funded by the hospital charity itself. Originally, we had a four-year programme of Arts Council funding. The programme of work of sending artists, and on the whole, they're musicians. We have a couple of dancers. We have me, a theatre maker, and I use my gobby skills, really, of getting people speaking, getting people to talk, getting people to connect, to remember who they are beyond being a patient in the hospital. This has been such a successful programme for Salisbury District Hospital. The charity had taken on funding it. We now have three days a week and there's a team of about 15 artists on a rotor. So there's a constant sort of presence within the hospital. On that team for Elevate, I go into the hospital and one-to-one -one work with patients by the bedside, on the whole, elderly and stroke recovery. And I work in a way that means that I have a very quick uh, relationship building with patients to try to get them to talk and to remember who they are and the world outside. Sometimes I take in objects from outside. I might take in a collection of stones. I took in, very popular is my collection of heart-shaped stones that my husband has given me over the years every time he walks along the beach and finds some funny thing that looks like a heart. Elderly ladies love my heart-shaped stones. They'll hold a heart-shaped stone and it will release so much to talk about. A lady in stroke recovery sobbed holding a heart-shaped stone, not just because of the heart-shaped stone, but because the stone itself she could feel. The strange squeezy ball that the hospital were giving her as a stroke recovery patient, she couldn't really feel, but the texture of the heart-shaped stone brought out so much more in her. So I've been working in the hospital situation for five years, kind of observing, seeing, feeling, responding. As a theatre maker, as Hoodwink's artistic director, Elevate then asked me to create a show to go into hospitals. And again, we were funded by the Salisbury Independent Hospital Trust, 
which is a group of previous consultants who now get together and run charitable events and you raise huge amounts of money. Uh, and they gave us a little pot of money that we were then able to go to Arts Council and get match funding for. And I was asked to make a show in Hoodwink style. Now, when I say I'm a theatre maker, I don't take a play that already exists. I completely create it. I very rarely, if ever, make a show for an environment like this. It will be out and about, it will be site-specific, it will be in a place that you wouldn't expect. It will be on the street, it's truly democratic, we're capturing people who may not normally or ever experience theatre. And so I was asked, can we put this into a hospital environment? Can we make something that is immersive, sensory, magical, but can cope with the massive restrictions of a hospital? I was asked, first of all, could I make a show that would go to the children's unit and to the elderly care? And you kind of go, mm, yeah, yeah, there's similarities there, but there's also huge differences as well. My methodology to think about that was to really think about the work that I've done going in, working with patients. If you haven't spent time in the hospital, it's very easy to not be aware of how dehumanising it can be, spending long time in a hospital, particularly if you are elderly, you can't see very well, you can't hear very well. You're extremely isolated. More often than not, people are asked to sit by their bed. Hospital wards have changed enormously. Elderly people are sitting so far away from one another, they can't actually hear to have a conversation with the person that they might be closest to. So elderly people can spend hours a day not talking to anyone. They may be sitting there in a robe that is not theirs, and have no personal effects and no visitors, and no sort of sense of who they are anymore. They're completely disempowered. That's for the elderly, but that is also generally as well. People feel disempowered within a hospital. And so what I wanted to do as a theatre maker with Hoodwink in Hospital was to create a show that could suddenly appear as if by magic, but had to be able to go away again. Primarily, a hospital is about helping people, saving lives comes first. We needed to be able to vanish. You can't take in light set props. So we created a show, there are two of us, and I am doing it as well because it's such a lovely. I've made shows for over 30 years and had audiences of 10,000, 2,000. An audience of one in a hospital is the most powerful theatrical experience I have ever had. There are two of us, as you can see, we sort of look like we could be nurses. However, we're really looking, it's my homage to cleaners. My experience of working in hospitals, they're always on the periphery, there will be somebody cleaning. But not only are they just cleaning, they're the people who really connect with the patients. They're the people who see them every day and actually do have the time to talk to them. And I just think that they just needed to be included in there. Also, by wearing what we're wearing, we're kind of very approachable. Our status changes. We begin our performance. It's very gentle. It's about a 10, 15 minute sequence. We go in, first of all, I tell the patient that we're going to do a little performance. Would, would that be all right? Would they like that? We ask permission. They always say yes. We then do a little bit of sweeping around the room. That gives us time to suss out what's going on, but it gives them time also to think, oh, something's going on. By looking a bit like cleaners, we remove status as well. We're very approachable. As we move around the hospital, the ripple effect is enormous. People will stop and go, who are you? Ladies in white, ladies in white. What are you wearing? Who are you? What are you doing here? It sets off memories, nostalgia. It has a huge impact. So we can take performance into a hospital. It's small. It doesn't carry infection. Everything is made of paper. It disappears, and we're gone within 10 minutes. But I'm going to have to stop because we've run out of time. Thank you. Right, so I think um, open to the floor immediately. Uh, are there any observations or questions uh, generally of, of the panel um, um, uh, this morning? Uh, sorry, or, or, or um, any things that have occurred kind of this morning that it would be useful for us to, to, um, to pick up on as well? Uh, Stephen. Um, been really great presentations here today, but. I'm a little worried about a certain kind of fetishization of method. Um, I mean, method is like, you know, when you bake a cake, you don't, you don't have a method, you just do it. It's, it's practice. And I wish, I wish some of you would actually just have the confidence as artists to say, we do practice. 
and you know, leave it to other people to work out what the method is. But just as I think you over-emphasize method, I think there's a word I haven't heard her all day, which is fundamental to any inquiry, and that's theory. And what I'm really quite interested in is how do you know what you mean? How do you work out what you're doing? And that's what theory does. And I mean, you know, I've been, I've been working in academia for a long, long time. And my work is 90% theory, 10% method. So, okay. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. they said provocation. So, uh, that's a question. Okay. okay. That's a question. Uh, would anybody want to, from the panel like to pick that up or anybody else from the room in terms of the <coughs> theoretical basis for the work? I, I thought you perhaps wanted to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just, I, I feel too practical to be able to answer the question, really. I do. Um, maybe I, um, I'm not going to blow up as well. But, um, <laughs> There's something about being an artist. You do have a method, but you don't always be able to articulate it. Um, it's born out of many years of experience and what's in the room in front of you. As a dance artist, I don't necessarily have a theory. I have lots of methods, but they're not set in stone. So it's a little bit improvisational as well, which mm -hmm. hasn't also... You know, maybe that's something within creativity that's in the ether. I know that's not what well, academics want to hear, really, but sometimes you go into an empty space, you don't know what's going to happen, but you trust and know something will happen, and it always does. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, intuitive, creative, improvisational. I think they're really important for me as an artist. I don't know about other people. Anybody else want to? Yeah. I suppose... Um, in terms of the work the Happy Museum is trying to do, I think it's sort of um, one of the things is sort of theorising about um, sort of health and well-being and sustainability and sort of, you know, being inspired by sort of positive economics or happy economics or neuroscience. And sort of, I, so I suppose in one sense, it's sort of trying to create up a theory of what all the different museums are doing. Because in, in many ways, most of... The, oh, you know, there's, there's over 50 museums involved and we're probably all doing, we'd probably all be doing work that we're doing, but that comes under the Happy Museum banner. Um, so I suppose in a sense that is starting, but it is quite hard to articulate and sort of separate and say, well, that's different from other work that inspires us or action. Would you, uh, would you think that the, uh, the emphasis on method is is because um, the, the funding environment requires us to uh, analyze and, and talk about the impact of our work rather than the, rather than the practice and the, and the ideas behind the work. It, I think it's interesting because when you write an Arts Council bid, you tend to talk a lot about the content and the, the thing that you're actually doing and the artistic idea. Some people might disagree with that, but, I, you know, whereas some funders, that's not what we communicate, that's it's something else. I would just like to say the reason we're talking about methods is because we were asked to talk about methods. <laughs> like, we could talk about a whole bunch of very things that excite me personally a lot more than the methodology of the research, but, um, you know... <laughs> That's why we're here, right? Um, but I think, I mean, it's interesting. Some of the things that have come up for us in the research is a, a desire to almost create a kind of a how-to guide, you know, like a kind of blueprint of how to do this particular practice, um, and that being a kind of uh, a desired outcome. And I suppose that's about scaling up as well, the, the idea that the arts can scale up, go to scale, do things on a, on, on a much bigger basis. And I was having a conversation with someone at lunchtime about scale and how a lot of arts companies, that's not really what we do. And actually, uh, I, think, I think it's something to kind of challenge whether that is something that we want to do. And this idea of more and more and bigger and bigger and, and huge groups of people, I think what we do is, um, is something altogether different. And the different artists we work with all have different techniques and approaches and I think that should be valued um, that that uh, breadth of expertise as opposed to finding a kind of a, uh, a particular way of doing something um, there are a million different ways of doing things and I think that's the brilliant thing about the arts is it uh, gives you the opportunity to have all those millions of routes in as opposed to finding the 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 one 
you know, um, gold standard way of doing it. It's community arts, it's, it's diverse in its nature. Um, hi, I, I would like to respond to both the question and the answers, if that's okay. Um, uh, I think that the, the method thing is, um, it's like a it's like a torture chamber for most arts organisations, that the evaluation and research methods that they're supposed to put themselves through in order to prove that they're worth something, it's just horrible. And the reason, one of the reasons I think it's horrible is because the languages are not, the, the culture's not communicating well, so the commissioners talk a, a quasi-research language, but they don't really know what they mean by the terms, and they punish the organisations that they're speaking to by saying, you have to do this, you have to use rigour, you, you have to be robust, you, have to, you can't use anecdotes, you do this, you do that. And the arts organisations don't necessarily know how to respond to that, that confusion. It's just a mess, but the point is they need the money. So it's, it's, it's a terrible mess. That's one thing. I'd like to say the, the, the methods thing. And on the theory thing, I'm coming in from a different angle, if you don't mind, to say, that I think the arts sector, and I just have to claim a sort of dual identity because I've been in the arts sector for a very long time, but I've kind of just stepped into academia more recently. And I think that the arts sector in general has um, a kind of, is used to having a kind of shroud around practice and method, which is, um, it's, it's, imp it's important in some ways. I, I, I understand why it's important. This is probably a very long conversation that can't, can't happen here. But, but I think that until we do try to communicate with those who can help us with theories that try to unpick some of the things that are going on, we will never communicate beyond our own sector. So in other words, that other people outside the sector won't understand the value, the intrinsic values that we're always talking about amongst ourselves. And I think it's a, it's a partnership. And that's what this event is kind of, Therefore, I suppose, in some ways, the partnership goes, those people who know about the massive range of theories that are actually in operation in your work can help find those and tease them out and piece them together and create a theoretical framework that underpins the practices. Because obviously there is no, not just one practice, there's many. But that, that's, I hope that doesn't sound too cheeky. I just thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> I'm um, following on from that idea of the, the underpinning. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the use of the terms methods and methodologies, and I think they're being used interchangeably, but they're quite distinct things. And perhaps that's one of the main problems, I think, in academia, in practice, in day-to-day -day life, is the language that we use and I think somebody touched on it earlier, that actually from different points of views, you might be using the same word and meaning something entirely different. So f from my perspective, a method is a tool, something that you use to carry out your research. So it might be, you might use a method which is da your data collection method of interviews, for example. But the methodology is what the theory and the epistemology and the ontology that underpins those types of methods. That's a very different thing. Um, so more of a comment than a question. Hi, um, this isn't really about method. I mean, sort of doing field work, method is what works. You know, that seems to me. One of the things that floated though around a number of the discussions is this concept of improvisation, and I think that's actually something that is really interesting, and where we bring that improvisation into the sort of relationship with the kind of cultures that we're dealing with. And that, to me, seems to sit at the heart of a form of creativity and the way in which creative process might operate, because it's not entirely unmediated improvisation. That improvisation has to have come from somewhere, from that long backlog of practice that you have been engaged in, or we have been engaged in. We know how to improvise, and it seems to me that one of the things that you're talking about is the way in which we bring that, into it, that improvisation into a community. But as a practitioner, uh, having that sense of where your improvisation operates suggests that that is the point of the creative process because you're working within what, for want of a better word, might be called a genre, a style, a, a way of doing something. And I think that 
I'd really like to sort of get a response to, to, to that sort of sense of, is it unmediated improvisation or is it something that you actually do draw out? And how does that then operate within this kind of rubric of health or welfare? Does that change your creative making in any way? And if it does, how? Stephanie, I think you were giving some examples about how maybe your your practice has has ha has had to adapt for a new environment. Perhaps you. Um, I think working actually in the hospital by a patient's bedside. Um, there are two, there are two different ways. I work as me, an independent artist, one to one, and then I work as hoodwink, performing a show. That show is not improvised. That show is completely worked out, but it is able to respond to whatever is happening in the room on the day. And if the medical emergency takes over, we disappear and we respond with that person. One-to-one -one patient to bedside. I suppose what I'm bringing in, and for everybody, is playfulness. And the, the idea of being able to be playful and to gently be playful and just remind people of the world outside, really. And whether or not that's because we're holding some fresh herbs that have come out the garden this morning and we smell them and then we remember all sorts of other things that come and make all sorts of stories come out. Or whether actually in the show, in Hoodwink and Hospital, it's very playful. You can't really see it. It's only sort of 10 minutes, but there's a soundscape that goes along with it. Um, and we end with gently, carefully unfolding the blanket and a confetti spills across the room, which is a, a wonderful moment. In a, 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 unless you see it in a hospital environment, it just makes people go, oh, they can't believe we're spilling confetti in a hospital. But then we've also got our brooms and very quickly sweep it all up again and we're gone. And it's the sheer fact that we are being playful. We arrive looking clinical and then we break that expectation and we are playful and we do something that people do not expect in that environment. So just on the thing of improvisation, I mean, I think many people have different ideas about what improvisation is and people think about jazz and in dance we use it a lot. But in response to your thought about well-being, uh, I think our lives are quite regimented now. You know, we, uh, you know, have to fit in. And I think offering people a chance to be freer to improvise and learn it is a learned skill to improvise. Um, gives a little bit of empowerment and therefore confidence. That's you know my thought perhaps about impro. I mean, it's not any one way of doing improvisation. The improvisation has many ways of doing it, but I think if you can offer people a chance to be a bit freer and not stick to the script sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you need to, of course, but yeah, so that's my thought about it. Uh, with our sort of work around child-led play, um, the improvisation is sort of coming in the training and support that we've provided to um, other museum staff and sort of encouraging parents to let that natural improvisation that children will do anyway. So I suppose it's that sort of, um, you know, really prompting us as, a, as, as an open space, but, um, but also another project of the Happy Museum, and again, I know these are just specific examples, is the Woodhorn... Um, Woodhorn Colliery Museum in Northumberland um, had a comedian in residence and um, was working in lots of different ways of sort of opening up that playfulness but through the, the theme of comedy. Sorry, just one, one last thing. One of the pieces of work that I'm doing at the moment is working with residential care staff in something called Dancing the Everyday. So looking at how they can find playful moments in everyday care. So that's a really, I suppose, specific example of thinking about how care staff can use, not learn how to deliver dance sessions, but can embed kind of creativity and improvisation and movement and physicality into sort of an everyday care pattern so whether that's getting people up and dressed or getting people washed or giving medication how can those things become more playful and more creative so that's quite an interesting uh yeah quite an interesting process with care staff 
Thank you. Any more questions or observations uh, down here? Um, just changing tack, um, NHS England's been consulting for the last three months on an outcomes framework which will form the basis for social prescribing, which there should be a ministerial announcement next week. Um, so there are three pillars within that consultation and they're asking what impact do you have on the people you're working with, their carers and their wider families, what impact do you have on community groups and what impact do you have on the health and care system. I'd like to ask you to um, share some examples of the impact that you're having. Could you just repeat those three? I can, sorry. Impact on the person you're working with, the carers and the wider family. The impact on community groups in terms of community assets um, and impact on the health and care system more generally. So just some examples of the difference that you're making that we know that you're making. Um, I, I can only be anecdotal and talk about kind of an emotional response, but with Hoodwinkin Hospital, um, we've, ex we've experienced going into a dementia ward where six people will be in bed, utterly disengaged, utterly, uh, the whole ward is silent, and when we leave 20 minutes later, two people are out of bed dancing with the male nurses, two ladies are still singing, one lady has made, a, in the course of the shows, we, do, we make a paper origami boats and everybody sells their boat. And one lady would not stop making paper origami boats and the whole ward became a flotilla. But it was also wonderful and the, the feedback from the staff was that they, and, and we get this everywhere, is they are seeing their patients as people and learning things about their patients that nothing else gives them the opportunity to do. Uh, impact on children in a very similar situation is to help to de-stress before an operation. We come along, we do the show, they make a boat, they forget they're about to have an operation, or even if they're in recovery from an operation. Um, in, in a wider way, uh, for Salisbury District Hospital, which I think is quite forward in its programme and it's becoming quite embedded, um, the impact I have now been asked by, I'm now working with the Teen Diabetes Clinic to work creatively with teenagers who have to come in four days, four times a year. They've asked me to come in and work creatively with them, which is amazing to be asked. I was asked to work one-to-one -one with a Burns patient who had been in hospital for a year with 80% burns, was at the very end of her life, would I come in and work with her to help improve the quality of her life in those last couple of weeks? Which, would, for me, was an extremely profound experience. Um, and again, and Alice did die, but again, the response from that was, we need more, we need this to happen more, that even in those last few weeks of someone at the very end of their life, it made a difference. Um, so we measure impact in lots of different ways using the dance research. So there's obviously personal impact to the individual where we're looking at their physical and psychological health via questionnaires and in the focus groups. But we also look at the community group. So the dance in In Time is originally funded by Leeds Public Health. Um, but then there's an opportunity for the older adults to continue that within the community group if they want to. So they start to pay a small fee and make that group self-sustainable. And then we offer that to other older adults in the community. So that's a way we're impacting the community. Um, in terms of like return on investment and health economics, we're now looking at how dance reduces the number of visits to their GP or any hospital appointments that they have, and we're going to measure that long term to look at the return on investment uh, in that respect. Um, I mentioned before about dementia care mapping and we've just trained two of our core team at Yorkshire Dance as dementia care mappers to map this new project and one of the interesting things we've been doing a three year project in Sheffield in an area called Parson Cross in Sheffield some of you might know that area it's quite a deprived ward of Sheffield and we've been doing an intergenerational project bringing primary school children into a residential care home and dancing together it's called We Danced the project um, and the, we worked with the dementia care mapper in Sheffield who went in and looked at um, she mapped about five sessions, two when we weren't there, so when there was no dance team, and three when we were there. 
And that, this has built the research for this new funding bid, which is about the impact of touch, because one of the things that the mapping revealed is that people's well-being uh, peaked at the point that there was touch in a session. So, so there was lots of learning from that as well about the artists, for the artists, and how they interact with the group as well. So things like... Um, you know, when residents are sleeping, to actually wake them and invite them to take part. Um, so there's some real learning in terms of the artist practice. Um, there was some a whole uh, observation around who they engage with in the circle. So they were more likely to engage with the women in the circle than the men. Um, so that, and we have an all-female team of dance artists leading that. So there's lots of like um, ways it's impacting on the practice and how we might deliver. But it was really interesting for the um, that particular care home to share that mapping and to think about the impact of touch and how that that can be developed for them. As I mentioned with the Inspiring Futures um, uh, volunteering for well-being, well -being, uh, one of the reasons that part of a large part of the HLF grant was um, to do an SORI project was to actually sort of provide that impact and that evidence um, to sort of say we know we're making the difference to these individuals and their families um, but very much it was important as being about a partnership across 10 museums across Greater Manchester but also to be a tool for other museums and cultural settings to use. Um, in terms of Manchester um, uh, our director, Esme Ward, is very key in sort of uh, negotiate, you know, being involved in devolution in the local health setting with Greater Manchester. And um, we have a great partnership with uh, the museum in the Whitworth uh, with the NHS, with the local NHS trust. And that's sort of based on um, that partnership building to sort of show the, the impact of the work that we do at a number of different levels. And that has been now sort of making changes at that sort of political level. Um, Manchester Museum is also going to be, um, Greater Manchester is uh, an age-friendly city in a region. And uh, Manchester Museum is going to be the centre for an age Friendly cult uh, culture, age friendly culture. So, sort of looking at intergenerational work. Um, so, we're very excited about that. Thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the questions and, and comments from the floor. And if you would join me uh, in uh, saying thank you to our panel members as well. Thank you.